Welcome to another episode in the Kips podcast. My name is Tyler Valencia. I'm the president of Kips and Time to Train Fitness. I have a returning guest, somebody that even prior to this hitting the record button here, we were chatting it up on so many different items, so many different topics, and we're going to be returning to a topic that him and I have already discussed in length. That is small group training. I have Anthony Wall. Anthony, thank you first for coming on the Kips podcast again. Ila, thank you so much for having me back on. As you said, we were talking beforehand. We can talk for a long time. Exactly. Got a lot of talk about today, really excited to be able to talk about continuing the conversation about small group training. And hopefully everybody that gets a chance to listen to this and watch this can get a few nuggets to help them with their programming as we go into you know the back end of this year and also into next year. Exactly. So great timing, great timing. We're winding down with 2023, 2024. What are some ways that we can build our business, grow our client list, all those types of things. But for the listeners, and I have to throw out there that if you are listening or watching this episode, head back to that first episode to get more of a background. Anthony does talk about how he got to working with Ace, one of the top providers, educational providers in our industry. He goes through his full background and how he got there. And so in that episode, go check that out. But Anthony, a quick little background on what you do right now, uh, what you've been up to in the industry. Uh, We'll leave the really the nuts and bolts that you went into in the first episode for people to go listen to. Okay. Well, my role now is a senior director of global business development uh, with the American Council on Exercise. And I, I've said to a few people over the last couple of years, you know, it's a little bit odd overseeing international business development going through the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic when so much yep. around the world shut down. And yep. we found ourselves not being able to have many of the conversations we wanted to. Focus was on a lot of different things in terms of, for many people, just staying, keeping their heads above water and just staying alive in their businesses globally. Yep. I would say that we've been pretty lucky in in terms of the conversations I've had with most of the people that I work with, that they've been able to sustain their business to some level during the pandemic. And as we came out of the pandemic, which for us here in the US is probably last year, the beginning of last year, and of of course, it's different in different places, spent a lot of my focus on really trying to support our partners who are training fitness professionals in their countries around the world, supporting Mm -hmm. them with existing programs, ways that they can perhaps uh, be more productive with their marketing, different packages and programs that we might have they want to look at. And obviously something that, that Kips is very strong in is the continuing education side as well. And that's yeah. really where I spent a lot of my my time and my days at this moment. Big, big, big job, big task. And especially as you mentioned with the pandemic, I can only imagine what that process, what that brainstorming process has been like. How do I adapt to it? How do I continue mm-hmm. to help our partners? Because I mean, ACE, I put them in the top three easily, easily in the top three of the educational providers out there and to do what you do and speak in different countries, grow the brand, all that kind of great stuff. Those are things that I know personally, when you enter this fitness industry, you don't often think about the education side. You are mostly thinking teaching group exercise, small group training, or you're a personal trainer. How am I growing on that? my business in that area, but the education side, it's another side of our, our industry that it's crucial. It's an important piece. How do you grow? How do you continue to learn? All those pieces are a part of it. And so it's been a treat. I know for myself, I'm sure you're in, in the same boat to be able to work on this side of our industry and you get to really use a different, uh, so many different tools in your toolbox, not just your training mindset, your exercise science background. But uh, let's get into here some small group training. And I'm going to tell you, I did a little research prior to our episode. <laughs> I uh, I looked up what are some common questions about small group training that potentially clients are going to come and ask you, or maybe they're going to email you about if you're running small group training. And I was like, these are not that bad. I think I was like, these will actually be pretty good for our episode. So the first one, and then and when I read it, I was like, right, I'm going to put it in there. Should you have individualized client programs at small group training? I thought, okay, that's a pretty basic question, but it's one that you should have an answer for. What do you think about that one? As we get into some of these conversations, because I know that there's going to be some different opinions of people watching and listening, yep. you know, I would like to preface this with there are always different ways of doing things. And for the most part in our industry, we can have different perspectives and philosophies. There are some yep. things that, you know, in general, we say, no, that's not a good idea. And, and we can give reasons for that. So I, I'd preface 
this with uh, perhaps there are scenarios when this would work. But if we talk about small group training in kind of a general sense where we're getting a, a group of individuals together, doesn't matter about their age, doesn't matter about their demographic makeup, but we're getting a group of individuals together who want to have a common experience, have a shared bond in, in getting an outcome or having a great experience. Uh, the individualization of the small group training in many environments, again, the general, is probably not the main issue that they're coming for. Mm -hmm. They're coming for an experience. They're coming to have some fun. They're coming for some social engagement. They're coming to get a result, but that result is a common result. So in other words, I want to jump more. I want to get stronger. I want to run faster. I just want to have fun indoors or outdoors. And some of those general things, those don't need an individualized approach. Now, with mm -hmm. that said, Tyler, one of the benefits of small group training for a lot of people is it gives them some insight into, hey, this instructor is really good. Maybe I could work with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Perhaps I can weave that into the small group training sessions. Maybe I'm having a couple small group training sessions a week and I'm having some short, more individualized time with that instructor on other sessions. And that's really where I would kind of integrate that thinking of, should this be individualized? I prefer not to have an individualized approach to that level within the programs. However, that one-on-one -on -one time comes either before or after those group sessions. But I know we're going to dig into this a little bit more and I can <laughs> add more context to that. Yeah, I I think it's a great answer because uh, oftentimes I think that's the mental block we have as a fitness professional is that we come into a situation. And I'm talking more from coming from personal training to group exercise or small group training is that we are so it's so ingrained in our head. We need to do a progressive overload. We need to program each week, each exercise. How am I providing variety? But oftentimes clients or members are coming to our classes, our small group training to to just move. And mm -hmm. they are coming from a variety of backgrounds and the time it involved with it or the time to program for so many different populations. We often don't have that time. And what might just be the best for them is just a workout that just gets the blood pump and gets their, their muscles moving, gets them moving through a variety of different planes of motion, things that they would have never even imagined because they don't know. I think that one of... Um, my biggest issues, I was thinking about this last week, was how I don't think that there's enough information out there for the general public to know how do they even get started. I think that our general public is just so, um, they're ingrained that I, I think one of the, <laughs> one of the, I think it, uh, one of the recommendations for exercise is, is just to do exercise every every day. I think that's one of them. I know that's evolved over time, but I think Move yeah, you should more, be- sit less, right? Yeah. yeah. And it's- if I was if I was somebody that didn't have an exercise science background, how would I take that? I, what, what does that even mean? Where do I even start? I think that that the just coming, just starting is sometimes the hardest part, but they don't know the steps to get there. And that's why uh, the individualization of a, of a small group training, I don't think that would be the best return for an instructor. They wouldn't mm -hmm. get as much they were turn on it if they were spending all that time trying to individualize for each program. So that's my own feedback on that with now small group training and putting together a program. Now you're making your programs, you're, this is going to be Monday, this is going to be Wednesday, whatever, how many days with it. Are you generally telling instructors that they should be basing their programming on each person's fitness level? You know, I'm going to talk about the programming from when I did it in my, my my early days, and I know that we've evolved over time. But one of the areas that we were successful in um, was creating kind of a template, and we worked from what is the objective you want to accomplish in the workout you're doing today. And you mentioned the Monday, Wednesday, Friday. What is the objective we want to accomplish in today's workout? And and that's kind of the group objective or the feeling, the theme for the workout. But what are the objectives for the individuals? And those are more general. So we want to feel empowered. We want to feel we want to feel excited. We want to feel a sense of accomplishment. Some of these types of goals that are larger, uh, easier goals to understand at a, at a higher level. Yeah. In terms of kind of that individual programming, whilst there are many opportunities to cater for individual abilities within a program, individualization is not in my opinion, the main goal for small group training. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, when you go to a movie with a group of friends, part of the reason why you go with a group of friends is to have that social connection and the social enjoyment. Because you can watch the movie on your own and you'll you'll see the movie. But the group that you're with is what makes it fun. And in the same with small group training is we can do a lot of these workouts on our own, especially the small group based ones, which may not be as, as intimate with equipment or use as much complexity of equipment in some of the versus individual sessions. But we can still have a lot of fun, but the fun comes with the group. So, mm-hmm. so my goal is really about let's think about how we can maybe make challenges that cater to different groups. So I'll give you an example. Let's say we're doing an outdoor training session and it involves some level of running. Well, if I ask the group that you need to run 100 meters and run, do something and then come back as an example and you're, you're on a playing field, I know that different abilities may not be able to make it there in the same amount of time or maybe 100 meters is too far. So the mm-hmm. way that perhaps we individualize that is say, you're going to run for a certain amount of time. So it doesn't matter how fast you run or how far you run, you're all going to run around and do it for a certain amount of time. Or you might say, hey, if you're feeling really like you want to push yourself today, you're going to go to this cone. If you're not as comfortable, you feel like you want to go a little bit slower pace, you'll go to this cone. And for those of you who just started today, not really sure how to set your session, go to that cone. And we actually use that kind of methodology in some of our previous program with my last company. So everybody Mm -hmm. felt it was a little bit individualized, Tyler, but not to the point where it's like, it's only you and you're the only person doing this because that defeats the perfect of us being in a group. A quick little promo break here in this episode. If you're a fan of the Kibbs podcast, you know that at some point there's a promotion for the Naboso Duo insoles. I just pulled these out of my shoes, gave them a quick rinse to get the sock dust off of them, and I wanted to talk about them because they're great, they're fantastic. They make an impact on your daily life. If you sit at a desk or if you're on your feet, sometimes your feet just feel achy or maybe they feel like they went asleep. That's for myself. I felt like after working a full day that my feet did not want to go to the gym, work out, do something active, and it led to some bad habits. But with these, I feel more active. I feel like I can do more things and I've been using them for over a year now with your clients, with your family, with your friends. Share them, talk about them, see what they think because they really do make a difference. If you, if your feet feel more active, you're gonna be more active and that equates to being more healthy. Check them out, there's a link in the description. See all the products they have and let's get back to this episode. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, you hit it on the head there, which allows different fitness levels to be in the same group, enjoying it, being there for the camaraderie, being able to enjoy with a friend that might be much more in shape or less in shape, Mm -hmm. but they're there for their community. They're there to enjoy with a friend, a family member, whatever that might be. And that is one of the beauties of doing small group training. Now, a question that I thought of myself and I got to give myself a little pat on the back because it's one that when I did work in a gym setting, this was often a hard time. And this has to do with uh, some of the keys for uh, doing small group training on the fitness floor, that is. Uh, And with doing this type of work on the fitness floor, not only are you having to uh, maneuver other members but also being aware of our fellow colleagues that are trying to do their own training. I think that there's a lot of, uh, it might be difficult. The easy thing, of course, is to go find an open fitness room or a area of the gym that's available. But I can say, I know that some members, they do enjoy going on the fitness floor, learning exercises or using equipment that they would have never even thought of. Because I I mean, we can talk about this more that some members, they find it intimidating to mm-hmm. be on the fitness yeah. floor. They sometimes call Very it the guy intimate. area. They, mm-hmm. they they say, oh, that's only where the guys go. And they would have never have thought about that. What are some of your keys? You have to be fit to come into that facility and work out, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. What yeah. would you uh, recommend as some keys to doing uh, small group training on the fitness floor? You mentioned something there around that intimidation. Uh, and, and intimidation is often, you know, this preconceived belief that. And part of that is, marketing, part of its advertising, part of it's what we mm-hmm. see on social media, and everyone's yeah. impression about what small group training is. If, if I said kettlebells, everybody who's watching is going to have an image in their head of what the kettlebell session is. That's all I've said. I just cued that. <laughs> but we, all, we know that those sessions are all going to be very, very different. 
Mm-hmm. So we have to, I think, as an as an industry, think about the perception that we want people to to see when they're thinking about small group training. Yeah. When it comes to working out on the floor within our facilities and our clubs, that is such an individual experience because we don't know how much space people have. We don't know what equipment they have. But you know, in in one of our courses that we run, we talk about being able to program both on the fly but also programs with the equipment you have and so the the look and the feel and the access to equipment that you have today might even be a little bit different from what you had yesterday and next week because when you go on the floor you don't have access to all that same equipment so it's really the expertise and you talked about this in terms of the continual learning is being able to understand what again your objective is because if my objective is for everybody to feel a sense of accomplishment I don't have to have a specific piece of equipment to do that. I can do that lots of different ways. But mm-hmm. then when we show up on the floor and we know what equipment we have, then we know what we're working with. And people often say, I need to know what I'm working with beforehand. If that's the way you program, then you have to do it in an area where you can control the environment. On, on you know yeah. Thursday at five o'clock, you don't have a lot of control in the environment. <laughs> so perhaps your group has to be a little bit smaller and you have mm-hmm. to be a little more um, uh, kind of willing and be flexible. But yes, what's your objective today? Because that determines the outcome. And if your objective is about having a fun, enjoyable workout, then you can do that with lots of different equipment. If your objective is to to run faster, you might be finding a little bit more challenging on Thursday at five o'clock in this limited bit of space you have on the gym floor. Yeah. The two pieces that I, I like, the first one being the adaptability with it. And you hit it again on the head with the experience level. As you get more experience, you start to learn that, okay, this piece of equipment, this is the ideal one that I wanted to do it with. Let's say that, what is it called? A a Mm T-row, that machine that's typically in a gym. Oh, that one's taken. Okay. I need to move my client over to the dumbbells. They can just do bent over rows or barbell rows. And that experience just comes with time. Just learning more exercises, building your base. I think I had somebody when I first started off, their best advice was, just learn as many exercises as you can. I think she said, Tyler, write down all the exercises that you know, and just add to it continually. Just put them all down on paper, organize them in a way that you just know, here's my back exercise, my leg exercise, chest exercises, and just continually add to it because you start to learn. You're seeing, you're thinking about it when you're personally doing your own workouts. You're thinking, oh, this is I like this. I can substitute this in this manner. And I think that, That capability comes with experience, but it comes with the willingness to grow, learn, and all those areas. One of the pieces that I did want to throw in there with the the timing of it, uh, if you're in a peak peak hours, of course, it's going to be harder to be doing uh, group, small group training on the fitness floor, but with also your colleagues and being aware of what they are doing with their own clients, if they're doing one-on-one at the same time, I think that's such an important piece because their opinions on on you and how you train you often don't think about those but they mm-hmm. might get a negative opinion because you are taking up all the equipment and so being able to understand hey i need to be aware of my surroundings be aware of my colleagues and even apologize when whenever i think is an important piece of it just to keep the culture of a gym to keep the professionalism keeping that mm-hmm. high is a big piece of it and if you do that I think that your colleagues might be willing to then adjust their own program if they are doing one-on-one, but let's say you have a certain area of the fitness floor already occupied. If you have a a good relationship with your your colleagues and your fellow uh, fitness instructors, they might be willing to adjust their own instead of thinking, oh, Tyler, he he takes up all the equipment and I want to do this exercise. But if you have a good and you're amicable, they might adjust right there. I, th- I think that's really, really key in terms of working. You know, we're talking about working the small group and as yeah. uh, on the fitness staff are a group, right? The, the the employees of the of the organization, the club, the facility are also a group. And when working with them in an environment that that creates um, creates a, a positive experience for all of us is in, is is really is our goal. I wanted to come back to something you said about you know when we're trying to figure out exercises. Sometimes we get really fixed on a specific movement or piece of equipment or, mm-hmm. or you know, uh, have to do the row. At the end of the day, in small group training, you know, 
if the goal is to learn how to do an Olympic lift, then you need to be in the appropriate venue. If yeah. your goal is about having a great workout, you want to increase your strength, you want to you know increase your energy, you're working on your lower body, whatever that is, I would ask the instructor when they're saying, I have to do this exercise, if you didn't do this exercise, what would be the downstream effect? Now, if you uh, really, really have to do that exercise and the downstream effect is that they're going to not get the same level of performance down the road, that's different. But really, Tyler, for the vast ma majority of these workouts, if I don't do that exercise right then and there, it won't make any difference to the client group, right? They yep. don't necessarily care or even know what the exercise was. <laughs> yeah. And again, if they come away from that workout having a great time, that what did you do to make them come back tomorrow? That yep. box has been checked, and that's an important box. And it's okay that you missed one exercise. Now, yeah. if it happens repeatedly, then we have to look at your space and the environment and your timing and some of those things. So I, I, I think being flexible and knowing those exercises is one thing. The other piece is saying it's okay if you don't get that exercise. Because when I was young, this is the order. And if I couldn't do it in that order, I was stuck because I was so inflexible because that's the order I've been told is the best order. Mm -hmm. Well, not for the experience, it isn't. Yeah, I agree. hundred percent agree. And I, I got a follow-up question here that's along the same lines of it. And let me preface it with, this might be the mindset of somebody coming from the personal training side to the small group or even to a bigger a group exercise setting that you are constantly thinking, I need to track everything. I need to write my weights. I need to write uh, how I'm going to progressively overload them. You're keeping all this information down. Should you track the load and progress of a client in small group training, or should you keep potentially just the exercises of each day and potentially how you're adding variety? Which would you place more emphasis on? My experience and my way of, of teaching small group training classes is we did assessments at the beginning of the period of time. And back in those days, we did them for you know the five-week program. So you do assessments mm -hmm. at the beginning, you do assessments at the end, and they're basic assessments. Um, we didn't track load, volume, reps, and things because that doesn't. And I would challenge a group to say, if I stood in your gym and watched you doing that, is that really what the goal of small group training is from the customer's perspective? When that means we're tracking reps, sets, weights, pin markers, all of those <laughs> different things. What we can do is we can look at you know time. So if, for example, we're doing a 10-second bout, next week we're doing a 15-second bout. Perhaps we're doing we are doing reps and we're doing 15 reps uh, movement pattern this next week we do 20 rep movement pattern those things we can we can build into the workouts if it's mm -hmm. a progressive workout nowadays a lot of these sessions title are drop in and drop out yep. so you, i've got four or six people training but last week the four or six people might be a different group some of them might be the same some of them are new so really the value of the tracking becomes less important Again, some of us say, no, no, Anthony, but we have to track. And I would say, why? If the experience is what they're getting, the engagement, the fun, and they're having a regular habit, they will get a result. And we can see that from lots of the research that we, that we, we see in the data and that we see online. However, again, it comes back to if they had a great experience with you mm -hmm. and you repeat that great experience over time, they'll be successful and they'll, and they'll get goals if we really need to measure, those are what those 30-minute, 15-minute sessions are like on a one-on-one -on -one basis. In fact, yeah. we had a program um, in one of my previous companies where uh, we had six female uh, clients. And over those six weeks, uh, certain days, we had a group <clears throat> session before the workout. It was about a 10-minute group session. We just gave them some feeder information. And on the other days, before and after the workout, just for five minutes each, you met with the clients just to do some real basic one-on-one -on -one stuff. So it was a small group training program, but we wanted to build in a little bit of uh, downtime to talk about information, but also one-on-one -on -one time. It was just very short touch times that we spent with these clients so that over the, the five weeks, the five or six weeks, they all had a little bit of one-on-one -on -one time as well. And that worked really well because they had that opportunity. If you want to do measurements, if you want to look at specific things that they could do that, and it didn't compromise the actual workout itself. Hmm. Interesting. Um, you mentioned something that triggered something in my head about data. And yeah. right now with a lot of formats, small boutique, 
gyms that are opening up, whether it's Orange Theory or some variety along that same line, I see those. I could throw a rock. I could probably hit five of them from where I live right now <laughs> in out in Phoenix. And with those, how you mentioned, it's pop in, pop out. But there is some data collection involved with it, real time data. And I personally don't know much about how much that plays into the small group, small training realm. Have you heard or do you think that data collection wearables has been a big part of that? The data collection piece, I would say, is less important for the client, certainly mm-hmm. important for the club to be able to understand um, number of clients. Perhaps they want to understand the average intensity they're doing. Obviously, Orange Theory is based upon getting in the orange zone. We've got mm-hmm. my zone. We've got the polar training. We've got some of the uh, other, other, many other training uh, modalities. That data, I think, can be useful. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure how much that data is necessarily being used for the end consumer at this mm-hmm. point. We have to be careful because how many of these clients join those programs because they're interested on in seeing their, their heart rate up on a zone. I think it helps in the moment and it can mm-hmm. helpful to give them a bit of a profile. I just, at this point, I'm not sure that someone comes to a small group training program because of that. I think it's a tool that helps them. And to your point, with these with these devices that we can now use, whether it's the the, the chest straps, the 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 body monitoring, our phones, accelerometers, and things in our phones, you can always get that afterwards, and you can use that as part of that conversation. Just mm-hmm. not sure, Tyler. And I'm happy for people to come and say, "No, Anthony, you're completely wrong." Just not sure if the typical client comes in and says, "Hey, I need to know exactly what zone I'm in for the next 45 minutes, and I need to see my improvement in a graph mm-hmm. over the next four weeks." We like that. I think yeah. it's a good selling point and a good feature to show people, but I'm not sure that's what's driving people into our programs. Yeah, good response. And I, like I mentioned, I don't know. Really, I don't have any feedback on that. I don't even wear a wearable. I don't, <laughs> I, I'm not, uh, I'll admit it on this podcast. I've gone, gone back and forth. I am, of course, about optimizing my week, optimizing my workouts, making sure I'm being efficient, all those types of things. And really? being a f- fitness professional myself, I thought maybe I should get one. Maybe it will be interesting data, but I have not gone down that road. Um, I have in the past worn one for a few months, but I'm not big on wearing mm-hmm. items on i mean i have my wedding ring and that's really about it but um that's the most important one so that's exactly yeah and <laughs> I, that's why i always i was thinking okay how can or is it even important but i think that one of the main points that we've been really hitting on is the community aspect of it uh, and are people actually there i think that's such a good question to think about are people there for that for X, Y, Z, or are they there <laughs> for uh, camaraderie? Are they there for the enjoyment of it? And that piece right there, the enjoyment aspect is, I that has been my outlook on fitness in general. I've changed <laughs> kind of in the last year and a half. Ha- have, how am I having fun? And how can right. I promote fun for the workouts that I film, that I do for YouTube? How can I get somebody to enjoy it? Because often people look at it as a this is going to be hard. This is something I don't want to do. So, painful. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That has been the marketing that we see common uh, for the last 10, 15 years is pushing through pain. Uh, you have to suck it up. And I don't think you have to. <laughs> I personally think that you can have fun. You, you can should, find you things. have to be like that. And, and you know, yeah. we look about that technology it, it, it could be a sensitive area because we invest a lot of time and as, as fitness professionals and, and coaches understanding using that technology. If we had, if I had six clients, guaranteed 50% of them probably are going to have some desire to track through a watch, a phone, a belt, and they can mm-hmm. do all of that on their own. And we can be there to help them in the background. I don't think if we opened up small group training to the entire population of our community, anybody's going to say to us, I don't want to do that because there's there's not enough technology. I don't know enough data. They're going, to, they're going to give us some really good reasons why they don't do it. And it's all going to be around a fear, lack of fitting in, uh, mm-hmm. concerns about intimidation, not being fit enough. It's going to be all about those things. Again, the most powerful thing when you look at small group training and, and group fitness as well for, for many of these programs is the fun factor, the enjoyment, the, the yeah. engagement of being part of a something big and having a common goal, which is, which is to, to enjoy and, and get to that, that objective that way. So yeah. technology, very important for many people. I, I'm not seeing it as the driving factor though, uh, for small group training. 
Agree. Agree. I want to go back to uh, what you briefly mentioned. I like how you mentioned that you would pull uh, a client, a part of a small group to give them a little bit one-on-one, potentially do some assessments, do some types of measurements. What were some of your favorite measurements or assessments that you've done in the past in the the small group training setting? I, I, we took basic ones and I, and you know, those of you people who know my background will probably understand the programs I'm talking about, but we took some really basic ones and we did some somewhat more advanced ones. So for example, one of our programs, we did a, a, a beat test, uh, a multi-stage fitness test, which was, can be quite advanced. It doesn't have to be, but if you go all the way through and get further down, it's going to be very hard. So that was one that I thoroughly enjoyed. And I enjoyed it because it was a very good benchmark for those people that really were focused on kind of high intensity and, and anaerobic fitness um, mm-hmm. to see where they were. That was one that we that we enjoyed implementing. I did it a few times myself. I've not done it for many years, so maybe I wouldn't like it now. But mm-hmm. some of the more basic ones that we do were step tests. So we used a three-minute step test, and we used some push-up tests. And those ones, we implemented those for a different program because they are easy to implement for a group of people. They don't take a lot a lot of time. If you're going to do a multi-stage test, you need the space, uh, you need a timer, and you need someone to be able to record stuff because nobody wants to get to stage 10 and, and realize no one was counting for them because you forgot. <laughs> but something like a step test is quite easy to do, and you don't need a lot of space. So I'm an mm-hmm. advocate of uh, population-specific or individual-specific testing, right? So for different groups, we use different tools, but mm-hmm. keep it simple because within yeah. a group environment, in one of our programs, we had, uh, it was a military style program, and we had sometimes 100 people in a program, multiple instructors to, to deal with those different groups. So we ran some a 5K run, a 3K one run. We did some push-up tests and some different exercises. But we ran it in an environment that was easy to collect the data. So even mm-hmm. if you've got a lot of people, if you want to be able to, to collect those, do those assessments, you have to be able to set them up in a way that they're easy to run. And we actually spent quite a bit of time thinking about how we took groups through the various different assessments to minimize the time that we spend doing assessments. No one, yeah. no one is coming to your session saying, hey, I want to spend the next 45 minutes <laughs> doing a whole battery of assessments. <laughs> exactly. Well, if I was to um, give some advice on this, on this piece, and this is something that I used to do, was when we were doing a push-up assessment, <clears throat> a part of a small group or group training, was I would actually have them keep count, but how many assisted did you do in it? Because mm-hmm. I think that, that even that small piece right there the ability to drop down to do assisted pushups and keep their technique. I think it shows different levels in terms of, okay, form is very important to mm-hmm. this group, to, to this class, but keeping that count right there. Oh, wow. I, I did half as many assisted, but I did uh, unassisted. I did twice as many, even right. that small little piece right there is a win for a lot of people that often never thought they could do push-ups or had a bad outlook on push-ups and to take it one step further taking what you said earlier with the uh, potentially spending a little bit of time with an individual from a small group having them maybe come in 10 minutes early and do let's say a push-up test and if i was in a gym setting one of the pieces that i was just talking about yesterday i was recording some content was using a smith machine and this is something that I used to do when I did one-on-one. I would do a push-up test, but I would go over to the Smith machine and just use the rack. And even the smallest thing, just being able to take it down a couple rungs, clients would just light up. They'd be so happy just knowing that it got more intense and they were able to do push-ups in a way that they never thought they would before. So yeah. I think those are very small wins that we don't think about as fitness instructors because we think oh, push-ups, I'll knock these out right now. Well, Yes. And also we're thinking got to be on the floor. Yeah. Right. There, there was no universal rule that says you can't do the push up in the Smith machine on, on level, you know, on, on rack number 15, peg yeah. number 15. But yeah. for that individual, that's their market. And so when they come mm-hmm. back in a month and they want to retest and now they've done more on that number or they've made it a little bit more horizontal, that's a, an improvement for them. One of the things that's really nice about simple assessments is they're easy to implement for us. Mm -hmm. Often they're not intimidating for our clients and we want to create an environment. This is about that, that um, self-esteem, right? Being able to, to build that self-esteem is we, is 
I have always said it doesn't take science to do something too hard, right? Anybody can say, do 100 of those and we're going to fail. The science is finding and, and being able to find something that's applicable for our clients and it, it doesn't make them feel foolish or make them feel like we're looking at them as if, yeah, I knew you weren't going to do this. It's really about building their self-esteem yeah. and making them feel confident and an assessment that shows them where they are, but doesn't mm, doesn't humiliate them. We sometimes see that, uh, yeah. unfortunately, is going to be the most successful su- assessment for them. And by the way, they'll come back and then yep. they'll do the program with you, they'll train with you, and then they'll see those results. 100% agree. I like that. And um, the segue here to now a little bit of programming, and I'm going to do a little bit admitting again on this podcast that <laughs> I know that in the past, even now, it's been a progression for me for including exercises that I might not have done. I or I might not do in my my regular program, but I might have members that or people that are following some of my workouts that that like different variety. That's the best way to say it. they like this variety. They they like that not just doing. I come from a background that I'll do bent over rows nonstop. I'll do squats. All things that are very basic. But when you work in this industry, you tend to just like the basics, but adding variety, add a little spice, clients like that. And for myself, it's been doing research. I will research on YouTube. If uh, people watching this day that follow me, they know that I teach YouTube workouts and I will go on YouTube and I'll just search. I'll watch different instructors, what they're programming, what they're doing. And I get tons of ideas that I would have never thought myself to, yeah. to, to program. And that has been growth. I, I think it's growth because mm-hmm. it's willing to do something that I would have never thought of, not would have never done. How do you create variety for a small group training? What are some tips that you have for our listeners? Well, when we were, were programming um, the workouts for these preset, pre-designed programs, we started with objectives about what we wanted to, the, the workout to feel like. We mm-hmm. built a lot of uh, what I would consider competitive or team environments in there. Um, so perhaps we did three people mm-hmm. doing something. We did two people versus two people. We did the whole mm-hmm. group of people doing stuff. So that gives you a very different feel. Yeah. In terms of the exercises, we as a group, and this is how I, I also do it now, is we sit down and said, okay, we've got this equipment. We've got this space. What do we want this to feel like? This is upper body. So to, to your point, sometimes we said, all right, we've got this list of exercises Pick two from this category, two from this category, two from this category. I've always been a strong believer, Tyler, that when it comes to small group training, the exercises themselves are not what get the effect. It's the combinations. So Mm. think about an egg. You can use eggs for lots of different things, including just boiling them and eating them that way. But they're in other things and they're in other things because they make that um, recipe different or they, they, they give it a, a different consistency or something. And it's the same with exercises. So I, I have a look at lots of different things. You might come to me and say, I really want to focus on this area of my body. So that's one way we can program. Another client might say, I want to feel more confident about what I do. We're going to program things a little bit differently. We're certainly not going to be focusing on stressing them in an environment where they feel humiliated because that's not going to improve their self-esteem. Yeah. And so- when people say, how do I start? I have to go back to what's my objective and who's the population I'm working with? And then what equipment do, do we have? And then we can start to build on those different things. Yeah. I, I like think if we challenge all of our clients in a, in a humble and in a supportive way, challenge them is okay. Again, it doesn't take science to go overboard and smash them or do it the hard way. And no one's ever come to me and said, I want you to hum- humiliate me in this session. I want to walk away knowing how unfit I am and being reminded that I really shouldn't have been here. They mm-hmm. want to walk away feeling confident and feeling like, you know what, that was that was really fun. I enjoyed that. Or at the very least go, that's I can definitely do this again. Because if we don't do that and we don't serve them through that way, then they won't come back. And it mm-hmm. doesn't matter what program you put out there. If people don't come and do it, it's not really a great program. Yeah. Well, this re- reminds me of something that I talk about in one of my presentations about trust with mm-hmm. building trust within a group and whether it is small group, whether it is group 
exercise or even one on one, there's a level of of trust that's being built over a session. And that can be, I think, a part of it is a little bit of give and take, giving them a little bit of what they want. And then you give them exercises that you believe that are going to benefit them and get them moving along to the closer to whatever goal that they have predetermined. But with small groups specifically, and I you included an element earlier talking about the pop in model. There's a lot of people that just pop in for a session. Do you think that it's a little tougher in that as- aspect to do uh, exercises that might be a little, I don't want to call them out there, but something yeah. that they are, that's foreign to them. Um, do you think it's harder in that element? The difference between a structured progressive program over a period of weeks and the drop in drop out is really the, the ability or, and, and who you have on any given day. If you have a four-week progressive program, you can program differently, knowing that in general, most people are going to start at the beginning and move through the program. The yeah. drop-in, drop-out method is a little bit is a little bit of a, of a different style. Yeah. That, that, that one is not better than the other, and programming isn't necessarily easier or harder f- because they both have pluses and minuses. You drop-in, drop-out sessions, you could take a Monday session and always use the same format every Monday. So that might be easier to program than a progressive one. Uh, yeah. So there's different ways to look at it. Um, yeah. Something that's 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 harder with a drop in drop out is knowing how many people you're going to have come to the session. You have a maximum space of eight people, but you could have four people. But that's the same in a progressive session as well. And that yeah. really comes down to um, the experience and kind of how you've planned different scenarios. If I have five people, what do I do? And we did that. We said, if we have five people, how would we run this drill or exercise or evolution? One of the things you mentioned there was around the rapport of the group and certainly mm-hmm. building rapport and focusing on developing relationships is a key component of the reason why you have a coach. Yeah. Anybody in any sport or, or even in, in a business mentoring, if they have a good coach, that person, that individual is really the glue that helps them keep keep in line with the program and coming back and doing it. There are other things too. So part of being a good coach is that engagement and building rapport with your clients. And I think all of over my years of working with many different groups, there have been some times where we just didn't see eye to eye or we just didn't get along. And that was that was they were the more challenging clients. And I can think of two specific ones, but interestingly, both of them had a good time at the end of it. And part yeah. of the reason why they had a good time was because I didn't necessarily build a relationship with them, but they build that relationship with with their their, their their classmates, despite the exercises and some of the things they might not have liked as much. So it was kind mm-hmm. of an interesting observation as I as I reflect back on that. Good points. Very good points. All good stuff. Well, we're going to wind down this episode here and we're going to finish it with our podcast takeaway question that uh, it's the, I call it the OG podcast question here of the Kips podcast. And for listeners that are first timers, I got this question from, there's a documentary. It might be on Amazon Prime right now. This individual, he had performed 50 different Ironman lengths Mm-hmm. In 50 different states, it was, I remember when I watched the documentary, I was just in awe that somebody could do this and their body, his body was, of course, breaking down over that time period. But on Twitter, back when it was called Twitter, he was asked, what are three myths about triathlon training? And I was like, oh, how can I switch that? So our podcast takeaway question is, what are three myths about the fitness industry? Gosh. <laughs> where, where do we start? We have a we have a lot of myths in our industry. We have a lot of myths that perhaps a consumer might see, mm-hmm. uh, and then we also have a lot of myths that maybe on the professional side. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think I'll think of one that that just came up recently. I was talking to people about, and it was because of the change of the seasons. And one of the myths was, if I don't sweat, I'm not working hard enough. And um, you know, I use example. If you do the exact same workout in the fall and the middle of the summer. And I've seen some of your sessions uh, <laughs> when you're doing your Frisbee in the middle of the summer and you put a little temperature because I'm doing the same thing here. Uh-huh. Those workouts are going to feel completely different. Even though the, the the workout program is the same, your mindset on those different days and how your body is functioning on those different days will determine, you know, one will feel easier or another. So using sweating as a mechanism 
is 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 not a good mechanism. And what people say, well, that person's sweating more than me. Therefore, perhaps we're not working out. It <laughs> it, it doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a myth. That's definitely one that I would say. I like that one. In yeah. Arizona, you've probably experienced that. <laughs> That's a good one. Give me two yeah. more. <laughs> uh, gosh, I, I used to train very early in the mornings, uh, as early as 3 a.m. The reason I did that was not because I liked it, but because that was the only time I could get in the train that was important for me. It was, it, and I have always believed this. It was more important for me to get up at that time and train than it was for me to get the sleep I needed. Probably not the best mindset. But that is what I did. Mm -hmm. And some people say, oh, well, mornings are the best time to train. And while that may be the case for lots of people, ultimately, I know it's a little bit cliche-ish, but the best time for you to train is the time when you'll be consistent. And I believe that consistency doesn't have to be the same day, same time each week. Consistency mm -hmm. could be at 3 a.m. on a Monday. It could be at 5 p.m. on a Tuesday. And it could be noon on a Thursday. So consistency is in your schedule more important than what time of the day you train. Yeah. Yes, we can get into the, the 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 science and the circadian rhythms and go, yeah, but you shouldn't be training this time versus that training, that that time. But if that was the only time you could train, then that's going to be better for you. So I think, you know, setting the best time to train is very different for everybody. So I think that's I like a good it. one. Yep. And you can ask me for one more, aren't you? Yeah, uh, we spoke a little bit about intensity of training and, and making people building rapport with them and making them feel that they're successful in building self esteem. And, and part of what we often see in the industry, and, and there are many of us who like to go as hard as we can and push ourselves, and we want people to see that more isn't necessarily better within the general population of training in itself. There's a lot more research now looking at dose response, obviously of different groups. But also mm -hmm. the dose response of one person training over, you know, uh, six weeks at a certain intensity without modulation and without getting breaks and things in there. Many times you talk to a client and they come in and you say, hey, I'd like you to go and work and focus on three times a week. And maybe we'll start for 30 minutes. You go back and a week later, you see them in the gym and they're, they're on the treadmill every day for 60 minutes. And I've always wondered what did they, what changed their thinking process from when we sat down and met with them the first time to this time? Because mm -hmm. we often believe more is better. If we could take yeah. more pills, would it make us uh, healthy faster? You know, uh, if we could spend more money, would it make us happy? I, I don't know. But the, in the, the thinking of more is better in the gym environment really isn't something we should be focusing on because we don't know what the objective is. And more isn't always going to be better. Agree. I, I can't, uh, I would say it's very coincidental. I was just, <clears throat> when I was recording prior to our podcast recession here, I, I was mentioning that, that how I started recording these 15 minute Tabata style workouts. And despite my current level of fitness, which I would consider is pretty solid, uh, that just these small inclusions of 15 minute recordings, 15 minute workouts, Ooh, my body just felt that impact right there. That in 15 minutes, when people think that I need to be in the gym for 45, I need to be in the gym for 60 minutes, but 15 minutes when I'm already at a, I would consider a pretty high level of fitness, yeah. that made such a difference in my week. And I remember after the first time I filmed one, whew, I was sore for two, three days. You're and like, I was just, I was thinking to myself, Tyler, what did you do? Like what? It was only 15 minutes, but you're hundred percent right. Intensity, right? That intensity. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Before we sign off here, can you throw out any social media links, information about where people can find you in the future? I know you have uh, another big year, 2024 coming up. Any mm -hmm. information you want to share with the listeners? Yeah. Well, obviously go to the American Council and exercise acefitness.org is our, our website where we've got a lot of a lot of content on there. We have free content on there. We have paid content on there. We've got a YouTube channel. We're obviously on Instagram and Twitter. So you can look at us and all those handles. And then also if you want to, you know, come back to me and ask me more questions about this, my personal Instagram is Anthony J Wall underscore fit. So mm -hmm. feel free to ask me any additional questions because we'd love to be able to continue the conversation online. Um, you know, we ace, we offer a small group training workshop that we go to places and we deliver that workshop as a, as a five hour continued education course. So that would be a lot of the stuff we spoke about today is in that workshop. And that'd be really a good opportunity for, for businesses and, and organizations who are looking about, are looking to really evolve what they're doing to look at something that's really, really fun and easy to be able to implement, implement is, is, you know, 
would love to be able to help out people that way. Great. And I will be including those in the description, whether you're watching this on YouTube or you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, all that information will be in the description. As always, thank you for coming on. I knew that we would talk for more than, than I had planned. <laughs> and I can just say that from this episode, I personally learned a lot of things that I would have not thought about. So of course, always thank you, Anthony, for coming on. Yeah, Todd, thank you so much to, uh, for everything that you're doing with Kips and, and all of your things. I love to follow you online. And thank you to all of you listening out there and watching. You really, this is, uh, we're making a difference despite what people say. We do make a difference every day. And I know it's hard for sometimes because people don't necessarily believe that exercise makes a difference, but absolutely it does. And, and one person at a time, 10 people at a time, or a big class at a time, you are often the only people that have anything positive to say in many people's lives. And, and I think that's really critical for us to remember. So keep yes. up the good work. Love it.